Hey everyone, CJ here. This time I'm going to do something different. Instead of D&D, I'm going to talk about another passion of mine, and that is the study of the history of ideas. And my subject for this video, as you have read on the title, is Isekai, particularly how the trapped in another world narrative evolved over time to become the Isekai genre that we have today. To those of you who are not familiar with the term, Isekai is a Japanese term that literally means different e world sekai. It encompasses all Japanese media from light novel, anime, manga, and games, where the main protagonist is brought into another world. It can be an alternate universe, game world, or even the past or future. They all count. For clarification, I am using Iseka here to refer specifically to trapped in another world stories created in Japan in the late 20th century onwards. So what is the point to all this, you ask? Aren't all trapped in another world narratives pretty much the same anyway? No, they are not. The trapped in another world trope has been used since the dawn of time, but the kind of story we tell with it has been constantly changing throughout history. And Isekai is the latest incarnation of this narrative's evolutionary line. To know how we got here, let's go all the way back to the beginning. I have identified five distinct era in the evolutionary timeline of the trapped in another world genre. The first era is the mythological era. The stories I will cite here are not necessarily the first stories of their kind, but they represent motives common to that era. In the myth of Persephone, Persephone, the daughter of Zeus, was abducted by Hades and brought to the underworld. At first, she resisted, but was then tricked into eating pomegranate seed and she became the queen of the underworld. Meanwhile, in Japan, there is a similar myth. After the death of his wife, Izanagi, the creator god of Japan, ventured into the underworld to bring Izanami, his deceased wife, back into the world of the living. But unfortunately, she had partaken of food cooked in the furnace of the underworld. So, she was unable to return and was reduced to a monstrous form. When Izanagi finally saw her hideous visage, he was immensely shocked and immediately ran back to the land of the living, leaving his wife behind. The second era is the legendary era. Instead of featuring gods as protagonists, they start to feature mortal heroes instead. The Odyssey is really just a string of trapped in another world adventures for Odysseus. Instead of being separated from home by another dimension or a video game, he was separated by the sea and also his captors and temptresses. Back in antiquities, any form of travel was perilous and being separated by sea without a vessel is as good as being stranded in another world. For all the travels Odysseus did in his 10 years journey, he really only traveled a really small part of the Mediterranean Sea. He was also probably the proto-Isekai harem protagonist. He had a run-in with sirens, relationship with the sorceress Circe, had a child with a nymph Calypso, and received care from Princess Nausicaa before finally returning to his wife Penelope. That's a pretty good score for Odysseus-kun, wouldn't you say? Meanwhile in Japan, Urashima Taro rescued a turtle from being tortured. He was then brought to the Dragon Palace by the same turtle, and he was entertained by Princess Otohime as a reward. After some time had passed, he decided to return home and he was given a box that he was told to never open. Upon returning, he discovered that several hundred years had passed in his absence, and when curiosity got the better of him, he opened the box and was transformed into an old man. Here, we started to see a pattern developing, from gods to heroes to mortals. The protagonists of these stories are becoming more mundane and started to reflect the population at large, making them more identifiable to the audience. The third era is the Discovery Era. In Gulliver's Travel, we started to see features resembling the modern trapped in another world and isekai genre. Here, we are introduced to the concept that a seemingly ordinary person, an everyman, can become immensely powerful in another world. 
the normal sized Gulliver becomes gigantic in the island country of Lilliput, making him immensely more powerful in comparison to the inhabitants of the island. This changing perspective is most likely a product of its time, as explorers in the age of discovery have made contact with less technologically advanced civilization, the narrative of how a seemingly mundane person can become a godlike entity in another world entered our consciousness. The Spanish conquest of the Americas by the conquistadors is a likely inspiration. However, the Lilliput Island is only the first part of the four parts novel, and that is the only part most movies end up adapting. In subsequent parts, he returned to assume the hapless fish out of water character archetype. In part 2, he was a captive in the land of the giants. In part 3, he visited the technologically advanced floating island of Laputa. Yes, this is where Miyazaki got his inspiration from. And finally, in part 4, he is stranded in an unknown place that's populated by enlightened horses and deformed human-like creatures called yahoos. He eventually came to admire the horse persons and rejects other humans, considering them to be yahoos. Even after he was driven out of their society, he was still unable to reconcile with the fact that he had to live among other humans, all of whom he now considers to be yahoos. Now, this is a major development. For once, the protagonist actually wants to stay in the other world. Then, finally, we have the modern era, heralded by Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, where all the recognizable isekai elements are finally brought together. I would go so far as to say that this novel is the direct ancestor of isekai stories we have today. In this novel, Hank Morgan, a firearm manufacturer, received a blow to his head from a disgruntled employee, and he found himself inexplicably transported to the past, to Camelot, the domain of King Arthur. Using his knowledge of future events like the impending solar eclipse, he was able to save himself from being burned on a stake by deceiving the gullible medieval people into thinking that he was a powerful wizard. With his technical know-how, he was able to gain power and clout. He eventually ended slavery in medieval England and built a Gatling gun to battle against 30,000 Catholic knights, which he won with the help of 50-odd underage murder gunners. Yep, the novel is pretty hardcore compared to the Hollywood adaptation. In the process, Hank also nabbed himself a chatty waifu. Tragic end aside, this novel got all the important elements of the isekai genre today. Then, Narnia came around combining the chosen one trope with the genre, turning it into a popular convention, but it is not always used. For the rest of the 20th century, most trapped in another world stories have similar format to Connecticut Yankee and Narnia. Yes, there are a few subversions of the genre, but these are the base narratives they are subverting from. The Japanese isekai fiction have their own faces too. Early Japanese isekai animes such as Aura Battler Danbine, Inuyasha, Dot Hack, Lock Horizon follows this basic structure. Other than the inclusion of mechas and katanas, they are essentially the same type of stories. Nothing changes until the mid-2010s. I would call this era the isekai era. To be fair, this current development seems to be unique to the media produced in Japan. It may never catch on in the West, possibly making this a divergent evolution. But who knows, despite its size, Japan is a media powerhouse in the world stage. And we may see this development bleed into the West. To put this development into context, let's review the changes we have seen throughout different eras. In the mythological era, the protagonists of Trapped in Another World stories are usually gods. Then, as we move to the next era, the protagonists become steadily less powerful. Heroes in the legendary era, strong yet mortal. Then, the everyman in the discovery and modern era, followed by children and teens in early isekai media, and in this isekai era, they have become needs, hikikomoris, or other types of social rejects. In case you are not familiar with the term, Need means someone who is unemployed and is not engaged in studies or training. Hikikomori are shut-ins who refuse to step out of their homes or rooms. 
Meanwhile, the power they wield increases exponentially in relation to their natural endowment. The gods had godlike powers, yet they were powerless against the threats of the underworld. The heroes, like Odysseus, had the gods' assistance, but he still spent most of his time in captivity, hiding, or running away. The everyman in the Discovery era is no more powerful than we are. But what is normal for him turns out to be exceptional in another world. Shifting the power balance in his favor, the everyman in the modern era has the added benefit of his education, making him godlike, with Hank being able to defeat 30,000 knights with his guns and some assistance. In the Iseka era, the protagonists are practically gods because they are given cheats. Cheats or Chito is a term used in isekai fiction to denote the unique special power given to the protagonist on top of their more mundane abilities like education or athleticism. Admittedly, the term cheat had never been clearly defined, but I consider it to be something that is unique to the protagonist or at least possessed only by very rare few individuals. For example, there is a series called The Saga of Tanya the Evil where a Japanese salaryman was reborn in a war-torn world as a female magical prodigy. Yep, you heard right, this is a thing, folks. She brought with her her knowledge from her previous life, but that wouldn't really be considered a cheat, since her intelligence can theoretically be matched by the inhabitants of the world. But of course, this is debatable. Maybe you can consider this to be a low-level cheat, However, she was also born with superior magical talent and her possession of the only working 4-core operation orb given by God himself that further enhances her magical power are major cheats, even if it comes at a price. In the series Overlord, Ainz's guild possessions and character levels from the video game world that he brought over to the new Isekai world are his cheats. It is even a bit of an arms race in the isekai media industry to see who can create the most interesting cheats. Sometimes it is even subverted when the cheat turned out to be a lazy and useless goddess who creates more trouble than she is worth. The protagonist's attachment to the other world also changes throughout the eras. It starts with a complete no, nope, nobody wants to stay in the underworld, then it becomes a tempting place to stay in. But the protagonist would still prefer to go home. Eventually, it becomes a better place than home. Gulliver and Hank would have loved to stay in their other worlds, but they were ultimately dragged back home kicking and screaming. In the Isekai era, however, the other world is home. In recent Isekai fictions, hardly any of the protagonists have any plans to go home. Ainz doesn't look like he's trying to find a way home either. Neither do Subaru from ReZero, Rimuru from Reincarnated as Slime, and Kazuma from Konosuba. For the last entry, it is actually Aqua, the goddess he brought to the other world, who wants to go home. But to do that, the demon lord has to be defeated. Judging by her character, she would probably just waste her time loitering around until some other heroes do the job for her. One way you can be sure that they are not planning to bring the protagonist home is the use of reincarnation as plot device. Reincarnation provides closure to the protagonist's previous life and world, so they can forget about it and start anew, focusing on the more fun and exciting world with abandon. Another interesting development I discovered in the more recent isekais is that there is a lack of tension and conflict. In that time I got reincarnated as slime, for example, the main protagonist, Rimuru, just demolishes all his opposition without any difficulty. Even when there is a supposedly tense moment when the audience thought that he might get burned to death, we quickly discover that he has immunity to flame after all. Konosuba has the same deal, but then again it is a comedy. Comedies can get away with everything because they are not supposed to be taken seriously. For a long time, I thought that the lack of conflict in these stories is a failure in storytelling. But after re-evaluating it, I realized that this is not a bug. It is actually a feature. Many of these fictions are not meant to be grand adventures or a hero's journey. Some of them are just slice-of-life narratives about how an undefeatable protagonist gloriously triumphs over all obstacles. In a way, they are just outlets for the viewers to live vicariously. 
new isekais just gives their audience what they like. These are the refined sugars of escapist fantasy. It is also a reflection of the types of media we consume today. Cat videos, mukbang, where people just watch other people eat things, and gameplay videos by expert players. Stress-free entertainment. But I think this development is more relevant to the Japanese society as these medias are primarily created for the Japanese market. This complete escapism without the intention to return is indicative of this generation's Japanese citizens finally becoming overwhelmed by society's pressures. Stories of death due to overwork or karoshi and people withdrawing from society to become hikikomori is commonplace. The oppressive work and study environment, but enough is enough. The population is at a breaking point. That is why in recent years there is enough political will for the Japanese government to even dare to propose labor reform laws. The law was passed this year, but it would take some time until we can see if it has any effects. If you are a fan of isekai, you don't have to feel attacked. This is just an observation that I have made. It is by no means a negative criticism of the genre. I could even be wrong. But tell me what do you think in the comments. One of the best innovation that came out of this evolution in my opinion is the separation of the trapped in another world genre with the adventure genre. And this is how we get stories like Restaurant to Another World which is a series of character studies on fantasy based characters who frequent a restaurant serving modern Japanese cuisines. Trust me, it is much better than it sounds. In a way, I think the paradigm shift from perceiving the other world and its inhabitants as something to be feared or conquered into something to be embraced instead can offer us interesting new narratives to explore. Just because something is different, it doesn't mean that it has to be rejected and home can be wherever you consider it to be. Alright, that's it folks. Hope that was as interesting for you as it was for me researching this video. By the way, in case you don't know, I have released a 5th edition D&D class based on the Jojo and Persona series. You can find the relevant link in the doobly-doo. CJ, over and out.